Hi guys, welcome to lab number 4 of GG497, Geological Visualization. This week our lab will involve using structural contours that we construct for inclined strata and to show how those structural contours can be used to complete maps for areas where we have poor exposure. The first half of the lab gives you a series of questions that are based on the partially completed map on the following page where you can see that we have three separate locations where we've been able to see the contacts between a mudstone in red and a breccia in yellow in these three individual parts of the map and it's our job to complete this map based on the structural contours which we'll draw. Okay, so let's get started. The first question asks you to draw a set of labelled structure contours for the contact between the breccia and the mudstone. And we can see that contact in these three locations. Now hopefully that you remember that in order to start drawing structural contours, you first of all need to find points where you know the height of the contact. So that is points at which the contact crosses the topographic contours. If we start with these two locations we can see that the contact between the mudstone and the breccia crops out at 170 here and also crops out at 170 here. So what we can do is draw a structural contour that joins those two points and that contour tells us that anywhere along that line the height of the contact between the mudstone and breccia will be at 170 meters above sea level. So we've got one structural contour but in order to work out the spacing of our structural contours and the orientation of the structural contours whether or not they're, they're parallel or whether they fan we need to find another point where we know the height of the contact. So the only other place that we know the height of the contact based on the mapping is this location and at this location we can see that the height of the contact is exactly 210 meters because it crosses the 210 meter topographic contour. So we know the height of that location and hopefully from the lecture you remember that planar and uniformly dipping features so like tilted beds where, where the bedding planes are, are uniformly dipping they have the same dip along them structural contours for that sort of feature are parallel and are equally spaced so if they're parallel then we can draw our 210 structural contour parallel to our first one the 170 but going through this point at 210 So we've got these two structural contours, but wouldn't it be nice if we could get the 180, the 190, the 200, and so on and so on and so on. Well, the other thing that we know from these, um, from planar features, is that as well as being parallel, the structural contours for planar features are equally spaced. So what we could do is figure out the distance between these structural contours and then plot in the missing structural contours at the appropriate intervals. You see how the spacing between each of these structural contours is equal? That's the sort of structural contour pattern we'd get for a planar and uniformly dipping feature like a tilted bed. So you could complete a structural contour map going all the way up to I guess around here would be about 270 meters or so and that way down to maybe 80 but what I'm going to do is just draw the, the, the heights between 150 and 210 um, because those are the heights that I encounter in the topography. So the next question asks us to calculate the strike dip and dip direction of the contact and to display this as a symbol 
on the map near to the somewhere near to the contact well again strike is defined as the horizontal line that you can draw along a inclined surface and because these structural contours are connecting points of equal height they too are horizontal so therefore the strike of a dipping bed is parallel to the structural contours and because strike is a direction it's a bearing we measure it clockwise from north so what we can do is use our north arrow supplied with our map and then count around clockwise because it's a bearing and count that angle between the north arrow and the structural contour because our structural contour is parallel to strike so our beds are striking in this direction which when we count around clockwise from north gives us a bearing of 120 degrees now if strike is parallel to the structural contours then dip direction is perpendicular to the structural contours and points in the direction from high to low so a line that's perpendicular to the structural contours that's going from high structural contours so for instance 180 here down to 150 that is going to be the direction of dip and just like we did with strike we can put on a north arrow and then count around clockwise from the north arrow to give us our dip direction of 210 so we have a strike of 120 and a dip direction of 210 and then the last thing that we need to do for question 2 is to calculate the amount of dip the angle of dip along that surface well in order to count the amount of dip we can use trigonometry if we know the um, difference in height between two points along that plane and for example here we know the height of the the surface between the mudstone and breccia is 210 and we know the height of that surface is 150 here so we've got this change in height and we can work out over what horizontal distance that change in height occurs by looking at the scale of the map okay so the scale on the map says that 50 meters on the map is equal to uh, 50 meters in real life is equal to 55 millimeters on the map so therefore one millimeter on the map is equal to 0.91 meters it's a bit of a strange scale but I think something went a bit awry with the photocopying but nevertheless that's our scale so one millimeter on the map equals 0.91 meters in real life so the distance between our two points where we know the height of the plane of the of the contact measures is 88 millimeters so therefore the real life distance is 88 multiplied by 0.91 which gives us a real life distance of 80 meters now we've got this difference in height between 210 and 150 occurring over a horizontal distance of 80 meters so we can draw ourselves a right angle triangle where we've got that change in elevation from 210 to 150 gives us a change in elevation of 60 meters over a horizontal distance of 80 meters and it's this angle in here which is our dip so we can calculate the size of x the size of dip by taking the inverse tangent of the opposite over the adjacent and that gives us an angle of dip of 37 degrees okay so we've done our calculations we've got strike dip and dip direction and now we need to display this as a symbol and we display the dip and strike of beds by using a, uh, a long bar with a tick in the middle of it pointing towards the direction of dip and the long bar of that symbol 
is oriented parallel to strike so we can orient it parallel to our structural contours and we put the little tick in the middle pointing in the direction of dip so again from our structural contours going from high values to low values and then the number that we record is that amount of dip and by orienting our symbol that way we record the strike orientation we record the dip direction and we record the amount of dip the next question asks you to use the map and complete the outcrop pattern of the contact to show where else the two rock types would be found at the surface so what this question is asking you to do is based on our structural contours that we've drawn can we predict where the contacts between the mudstone and the breccia where else it, it should occur in our landscape okay well our three locations where we know it the height of the contact is the height of the topography I mean that's it's self-evident you're only ever going to see something on the ground so surface if it's the same height as the ground surface so what we can do then is use our structural contour map and mark on all of the places where the height of that contact given by the data in the structural contours is equal to the height of the ground so these points mark all of the places where the contact is equal to the topograph uh, to the topography okay so for instance here we're on the 160 structural contour the topographic contour is 160 so they're equal there they're equal there 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 and there and we can do that for all of the other structural contours then what we can do is join all of these points including everywhere that we've already got the contact those three locations that we've already seen the contact and that will show how the contact runs across the surface so I'm joining all of the points which have the where the structural contour height equals the topographic height and I'm not crossing any um, topographic contours where I'm not allowed and by doing that join the dot you can interpret where the uh, run of the contact would be through the map area then what we can do is I've removed the points to make it slightly easier to see then what we can do is add some color we know what side of the contact um, each rock type would be based on our, on our mapping provided and hopefully now you can see that we've completed our map to show where these two rock types would occur the next question asks you to calculate the apparent dip of the contact in relation to the cross section line XY so in other words what would the dip of the contact look like if you were to draw the cross section along this line XY now in lecture we covered this concept of apparent dip and we showed that if you were to take a cross section that was perpendicular to strike perfectly perpendicular to strike then the dip of the contacts that you would see in cross-section would be that true dip it would be in our case 37 degrees the lines that the, the bedding planes that you draw on your cross-section would be dipping at 37 degrees however if we change the orientation of our cross-section line so it's oblique to strike any other angle than perpendicular the cross section that you'll draw the beds on that cross section will look like they have a smaller dip a less steep dip they'll have what we call an apparent dip
and we can calculate this again using some basic trigonometry and that apparent dip formula is shown on the screen now and it says that the tangent of the apparent dip is equal to the tan of the true dip multiplied by the sine of the angle between strike and the cross section okay so let's take that um, equation and start populating it with our with our own data okay so the angle between our cross-section line and strike we can use a protractor to, to measure that angle and we can see that the angle between the cross-section line and strike is 110 degrees and once we have that number we can substitute all of the numbers that we know into that equation and solve for the apparent dip so our apparent dip then, if we rearrange that be equation, becomes the inverse tangent of the tan of the true dip, which is tan 37, multiplied by the sine of the angle between the strike and the cross section, that angle we've just measured, so sine 110. When we multiply out that equation, we calculate our apparent dip as being 35 degrees. So if we were to draw this cross section, at a one-to-one -one vertical and horizontal scale then the dip of our beds would look like it's 35 degrees in in real life the 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 dip of the beds the true dip of the beds would be 37 but because we've drawn a cross section at an oblique angle a slightly odd angle relative to strike that dip is going to look a little bit less okay the next question asks us to in the space below construct a cross section along the section line x and y to show the topography and the position of the contact at depth so based on this map that we've we've created through um, interpreting the structural contours if you were to draw a cross section through that map area what would it look like okay well the first thing that we would want to do is use our strip of paper and mark along that strip of paper the points where the cross-section line crosses key stratigraphic uh, key topographic contours so everywhere that I cross a topographic contour I mark on my strip of paper and then I take that strip of paper to my cross-section panel and mark on or transfer from that strip of paper the topographic heights to their correct position along that line x y so at 150 I've drawn a, a dot at 150 on my cross-section panel at 160 at 160 and so on and so on um, to, to show me where the ground heights would be along this this cross-section then what I can do is join those points together with a line interpreting where the valleys would be and where the hilltops would be and that gives me a hill profile that's what the crust would look like if you were to take a slice through it at that location then what I can do is go back to my strip of paper and mark on the structural contours for the contact between the mudstone and the breccia and the outcrops along the surface so I've marked on the points at which I cross the structural contours they're now marked in blue and I've marked on the rocks on the surface by coloring a very thin veneer on the top surface the top margin of my cross-section strip then what I can do is take that information back to my cross-section panel and transfer from the strip onto the cross-section panel the height of that those structural contours the height of the contact between the breccia and the mudstone so I transfer those structural contour heights onto my hill profile and then I join those points together to show 
where the contact goes at depth and where it would be above the surface. Then what I can do is add color to this cross section to show where the breccia and where the mudstone would be. And by doing that, I'll have completed my cross section. So by the end of this half of the lab, your map should look something like this. With the questions looking something like this. Okay, the second half of the lab involved a block diagram exercise um, to kind of really demonstrate this idea of apparent dip. And what you've been given is a block diagram that's unfinished that we'll have to complete and a map view. So a top down view of that, that block diagram. And the first question asks you to interpret the run of the geological boundaries and complete the map to show where the boundary should crop out beneath the lake. Okay, well, if we if we didn't have this lake, it's pretty obvious that these uh, dipping beds would continue and join up to their adjacent partners either side of the lake shore. So those contacts obviously continue along strike to join up outcrops across either side of the lake. So once you complete uh, that that lake uh, that map surface by projecting the contacts along the line of strike shown by our bedding symbols you should finish a map that, that looks fairly like that. The next question number seven asks us to draw the structure on the three vertical faces of the block diagram taking into account how the apparent dip of the rocks will vary depending on the orientation of the block face. So we have these three faces, these vertical faces, three cross sections, I guess, through our block diagram. And you can see that they have these different angles to strike. We have this cross section, where the angle of the cross section is perpendicular to strike. We have this cross section, where the angle of the cross section relative to strike is parallel and then we've got this face where we've got an oblique section where the angle of the cross section is neither perpendicular nor parallel to strike it's oblique so how will our rocks look in the subsurface depending on those those orientations okay well the rocks on our map looking at the dipping symbols they are dipping at 45 degrees and anything that has an angle of 45 degrees the slope the gradient of that slope has a gradient of 1 so in other words every unit of distance you move in the horizontal dimension you move it the same amount of distance in the vertical so it's a one to one ratio I guess of vertical to horizontal as you go down that slope Okay, so what we can do is take um, one of our beds, let's say the, or one of our contacts, let's say the contacts between the light blue unit and the green unit. And we can project down onto our cross section faces where those, um, where that contact would hit the edges of our block diagram by taking this one to one ratio of horizontal and vertical distance. So if we draw lines um, perpendicular to strike to show the distance we'd move along the contact in the horizontal, then we'd go this distance before we hit this edge. And we draw the same distance down the vertical. If we took a point here and drew in this direction to work out the horizontal distance until this edge and took the same distance in the vertical, we'd end up there. And the same for this um, part of the contact if we took this amount of horizontal distance and move the same amount of vertical distance then we could join up 
our contacts. Okay, so by connecting the points at which the stratigraphic contact would intersect the edges of the block diagram, you can construct cross sections showing how the subsurface would look in different orientations. Okay, and if we take a moment to look at this block diagram, you can see that on this face, the perpendicular face to strike, the dip of this blue bed is at its maximum, it's its steepest, it's at its true dip. The cross section that's drawn parallel to strike are rocks have an apparent dip of zero. They look horizontal because of because of the direction um, that we've drawn our cross section. And then this cross section face, which has been taken obliquely to strike, our beds have an apparent dip which isn't quite as steep as the true dip. Okay, so this block diagram tries to demonstrate how the dip of a bed on a cross section depends very much on the orientation of that cross section relative to strike. Okay, so then by adding color, you can show the geology and really demonstrate how that dip changes depending on, on the orientation of the cross section. So the last question asks you to label the following completed block diagram to show the angle of dip, the angle of apparent dip, the strike of the beds and the direction of dip of the beds. Okay, well our true dip is that angle in a cross section which we've drawn perpendicular to strike. So our beds are striking in this direction. So our true dip is shown on the cross section that's perpendicular to strike. An apparent dip is that angle of dip that we see in any cross section that isn't perpendicular to strike. So the apparent dip here is is going to be less than less than our true dip and then on this section it's going to be even less it's going to be horizontal in fact and the strike of our beds is parallel to our contacts these nice linear contacts showing that the ground is is flat our strike is parallel to those and our dip direction is perpendicular to strike and you can see from the cross sections that that dip direction is towards the south on our block diagram. So that's what your final block diagram should look a bit like. And hopefully the takeaway from this lab is that you can have um, these, or when, you, when you're drawing a cross section, you have to be very careful to take into account the effect that that orientation of the cross section has on the angles of dips that you're going to draw for your beds on that cross section. As a rule of thumb we try and draw cross sections as perpendicular to the main um, strike of the area so if you've got if, if your whole map area is a sequence of tilted beds then you try and take those you try and draw your cross section perpendicular to strike and that way you see the true dip the realistic dip of the beds, the, the truly representative dip of the beds, rather than some apparent dip which might be in some ways misleading. Okay, well thanks for listening to lab number four guys. I'll see you for lab number five where we'll look at some dipping rocks on the Penrith sheet. Uh, see you next time.